And that's where I think IEW does help because we really do break down progressively more complicated assignments into doable and achievable chunks. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So last week we had a conversation with Chris Poudois that we didn't quite get it all finished. And so today we're going to pick up kind of where we left off. But Chris, of course, you are Andrew's son. Can you give just a little bit of a recap of your life growing up with Andrew Poudois as your father? It was hectic, um, but I was blessed in many ways with, I do believe he's he's extremely intelligent and well-informed on a lot of areas that can help with education, and I happen to be homeschooled, so put the two together and hopefully you get something good. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And so you you shared a couple stories last time, and of course, I just will encourage our listeners to go back and listen to that first part of this interview, and then we'll just pick it up there. So you told a story about some struggles that you had when you were eight years old in Sunday school. You came home and talked to your parents, and that's when you first realized hmm, I'm not the same as everyone else. Mm -hmm. So tell a little bit more about your journey, because Mm -hmm. clearly right now, you know, college student, uh, successful in some businesses that you're working on, clearly you can read and write well. That's what you think. (laughs) Did a talk at a recent homeschool conference. And so how did you get from that eight-year-old boy that couldn't read to where you are today? I think of a lot of it had to do with how my parents dealt with the situation. And I'd like to first say, I mean, it wasn't perfect. And if you have a child with dyslexia or with some significant difference in the way that they process information, there's going to be a lot of customization that's going to go into the education and a lot of mistakes that are going to be made. But I do think that there are some things that I found helpful um, that my parents did that maybe our listeners can take, take a little bit of information away from. After I learned that I had dyslexia, and that dyslexia wasn't just this limitation that prevented me from reading like my friends, but was also somehow associated with, you know, geniuses like Einstein, or uh, a modern example would be Richard Branson, uh, who's a billionaire, has multiple different subsets of his company, but he has, you know, airlines, multiple different aspects of it. He's dyslexic, extremely dyslexic Mm. to this day has difficulty reading. Um, Once I learned about those situations, I started to to gain some confidence. But on a practical level, I still couldn't read. And when (laughs) you can't read, teaching stuff or learning stuff, rather, is very difficult, Mm -hmm. right? You can't put your kid down with a book and have them read about geography. You can't put your kid down with a book and have them read about science. You can't put your kid down with a book and have them read about mathematics. Mathematics, you know, there's examples, but if you look at a textbook, there's still large blocks of text that explain what each section is doing. And so I, I didn't have all that. So it had to be much more intensive. And initially, I was being kind of educated alongside my sister, my younger sister. She's three years younger than me. And at the time, she was, I think, five or six. Um, and what became quickly apparent was that she was vastly superior to me in the mm-hmm. area of reading and remembering. And I started to, to this started to get to me. You know, like, <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it started to get to me that my younger sister was, you know, reading things perfectly and I was, you know, s- <laughs> couldn't get through the word the, you know, to he, uh, to, he, to, to, to the, you know, <laughs> and she was just blowing by these words. So my mom noticed this, and she actually stopped educating me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, At the time, I didn't realize why she'd done this. And it was actually kind of something which I wish she had explained better, her reason for doing it. Um, But she she left my education up to my older siblings, specifically my older sibling, Genevieve and Moriel. Mm -hmm. Um, 
they would take turns teaching me and actually it, w- it was a good experience. I, I did learn a lot. Um, I went to my sister, Jen had a little um, mobile home on my parents' property that mm-hmm. she was living in. She's a lot older than me for those listening. She's, she's gotta be 10, 15 years older than me. Yeah. So she's a lot older than me. So she had this little house on our, on our property and I would go to her house, I think three times a week. And she would work through things like poetry memorization through math, math facts, through things that she could teach orally and I could listen to. And, and I would stand on my head while I memorized them and jump around (laughs) her room and basically do whatever I wanted. And allowing my physical body to do stuff did help quiet my mind and let my mind do stuff. I, I also have attention deficit disorder, uh, which if you're listening, maybe that, that explains my brain, <laughs> but I do have attention deficit disorder. And for me being physically active while learning was a huge, huge advantage. However, there was another thing that my parents did when it came to my education that I think was pretty significant. And that was hooking me up with audiobooks. Oh, they, my dad realized quickly that if you can't read, you can't gain a literature experience without it being read to you. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get those language patterns kind of ingrained, he actually set me up with an audio book or originally it was, you know, a cassette player Mm -hmm. and I would get the audio audios on tape and I would actually put them in. Um, but eventually it was an iPod and he loaded it up with different classics like tale of two cities, 20,000 leagues under the sea, uh, the road, Homer. Hmm. So wow. books that probably an eight-year-old should not have been able to no. listen to, <laughs> but I didn't know that an eight-year-old wasn't supposed to listen to them. And I also knew that I had this massive amount of free time because nobody knew how to teach me anything. And I was homeschooled, so I didn't have to sit through people failing at teaching me stuff. Instead, I had 15 acres with a river, a bunch of trees, and a portable audio device with tons of books. And I went crazy. I would just go out of the woods and imagine what I was listening to and let my brain take over. And for me, I do think that listening to that many audiobooks, I must have listened to 500 plus classics before I was 12. Mm, wow. And listening to all those audiobooks, I do feel helped me in the future when I started to be able to read and write well Mm. because I was able to kind of see those patterns in ways that people who had been stuck by reading you know easy readers might Mm. not have gotten to I do think that kids are underestimated too Mm. I think that their level of comprehension is much higher than their level of reading even for regular readers right and I think about when you say that Andrew talks about the importance of reading out loud to your children even when they are already reading because you can read to Mm -hmm. them at a higher level. Right. And kids can understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, if they can't understand it, they'll just try and piece it together as best they can. And maybe in the future, they'll have a revelation and be like, oh, that's what it meant. Mm -hmm. I had a bunch of those. I remember always like (laughs) thinking as I kind of like read more books, I would understand things that had happened in previous books and, you know, Mm -hmm. think laterally about books as we talked about in the last Mm -hmm. last. Uh, podcast, we talked about dyslexics thinking laterally versus specifically. So I would think laterally about different books and connect connect themes through them. Right. Good. Okay. So at what point did it click for you? When did you start re- actually reading? So there were two things that my parents tried in addition to my siblings helping me and giving me a bunch of free time and an mm-hmm. audiobook. They also tried uh, Lyndon Mood Bell, which was a I don't know if it's a national program, but it was a program in California at the time where they would help you with, I think I went for reading, but I do think they had a mathematics aspect to it too. So I went there for about, I, I, I have now heard that it's a month, but because of how I felt during that period, it feels like a year Okay. in, in my memory. <laughs> uh-huh. But it was it was about a month. I actually changed my name when I went to Linda Mood Bell because mm. I wanted to be a new start. I wanted to Aww. get the, the dyslexia beat. So I, I switched from Scott, my first name, to Christopher, my middle name. A funny story is that my dad went in to talk to the teacher who was working with me, and she said, so Christopher's been making some good progress. He was like, uh, Who's Christopher? <laughs> Are you sure that's my son? <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> he had funny. no idea. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, Linda Mood Bell did not help too much. And the reason why I believe it didn't help too much is because it was very phonetic based. And dyslexics have a, a mental difficulty with phonetics. Scientists did a pretty cool study recently where they had dyslexics and non-dyslexics read a, a paper. Mm-hmm. And for dyslexics, the front area of their brain, it's the Broca's area, was hyperactive, five times more energy expended in the frontal area. 
Um, but the other areas where other readers were able to almost like subconsciously automate their reading were completely dormant, not, not evident at all. And the, the Broca's area is used for language, but it's more used for speaking. It's not really used for, for written language. And so trying to compensate for a lack of those other areas with the frontal area is what can, can be so frustrating for dyslexics. Mm -hmm. Lindy Moo Bell focused on the phonetic aspect, but that was an aspect which is, was very difficult for me personally. Mm -hmm. That being said, I have heard of dyslexics that were able to make lots of progress with phonetics, but for me personally, it just confused things more. I had to learn more letters with little squiggly lines above them, and it was just added complexity and difficulty. The second thing that my parents tried after Lindy Moo Bell was Davis dyslexia. And that was where I can probably say a breakthrough happened for me. I was a little bit older, I think 11 at the time, um, 10 or 11 at the time. And Davis dyslexia has a two-prong approach for tackling dyslexia. So dyslexics tend to be very visual learners. Um, there is some evidence that the language parts of your brain uh, for a dyslexic are actually hijacked for spatial reasoning which stops them from using them for language tasks like reading, which makes reading more complicated, but visually, spatially, seeing things in your head much easier. That's why you have a lot of architects that are dyslexic. So the Davis dyslexia approach uh, teaches writing by using visualization. That's their first prong. And then the second prong, it works with laterality. So, you know, uh, juggling or moving things hand to hand to try and connect the different hemispheres of the brain, because that can also be an uh, area which some people would theorize impacts dyslexia. Being left brain dominant, which causes you to have more difficulties with, with reading and writing. I don't know which aspects of those helped me most, but I do think it, that the, the visualization work really helped it. What, the, what they had me do, um, and this might sound a little bit weird, is they had me re-memorize the entire alphabet as clay letters. Oh. So I would build the clay letters and memorize the clay letters. And the idea was that a dyslexic wants to see everything visually. Remember, we talked about how spatial reasoning is hyper, hyper prioritized in a dyslexic brain. So in order to take advantage of that, the D Davis Dyslexia Program has you build the letters out of clay so you can spatially memorize the letters in a 3D format. That way, when you're seeing a 2D letter on a page, your brain doesn't try to flip it anymore because it already knows what it looks like flipped. Oh, okay. So they had, they had me do that, and they had a different visualization exercises uh, to kind of strengthen that skill that dyslexics generally have the ability to you know, take an object in their brain, flip it around in multiple ways. And if you're listening and you have a kid that really loves to draw but can't read at all, they're probably a little bit dyslexic because they love to try and get what's in their head on paper um, because they can see it so three-dimensionally. Mm -hmm. So they had visualization exercises, reworking the alphabet, and also some, some work with just cross-coordination, moving things across, across that plane. And I do think that after that, in the next month, I, I read my first book. Mm. It, I didn't actually read my first book. That's a lie. I like to say it. Um, but I read the, the last third of the book that my dad was reading to me. And, and we had a little game going on where he would read to me while I was doing the dishes. Uh -huh. and the reason why I had to do this was because back in those days, headphones had these horrible cords, which yes. we now lo no longer have to deal with. And when you're washing the dishes, the water is everywhere, the cords are flying, <laughs> your headphones fall off into the water. It's just not very practical to listen to audiobooks while you do dishes. But it's, it's very practical to get your father to read you books <laughs> while you do the dishes. And, and one time while this was happening, I thought, I really hate dishes. Aww. And I kind of feel like I can read better now. What if I read and he does the dishes oh, for nice. me? So I, I flipped the script. I said, okay, I will read and you do the dishes. And he was all about it. You yeah. know? I, inside, he was all about it. On the surface, maybe he made it seem like a, a, a tough bargain. But, <laughs> but deep inside, he felt very positive about it. Um, so we switched. He did the dishes. I finished the book. I went on to read another book after that. Uh, the book I, I originally read was Bridge to Terabithia. Okay. I finished the last half of it. And then I read uh, Bark of the Bog Owl, which was like a... It's like a fantasy novel that just kind of reimagines our current world, I would say. It's a pretty good book. I remember it pretty well, and it was a long time ago, so I'd, I'd have to say it was a good book. And so that was when I really first started to, to read. That being said, I had a, a deep fascination with writing before that. And thankfully, my parents would, would just sit down and let me dictate what I wanted to write to them way ahead of time. And this is where I think 
I think kind of IEW plays into my education because IEW teaches you how to make keyword outlines and really messy rough drafts. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're saying you actually used IEW? <laughs> as little as I could. No. I, used it, I used it a lot. You know, I sat sure. in on all the classes that he would teach close mm-hmm. by and, and I, I did it by myself and I understand the system decently well. <laughs> yes. But the, the keyword outline, which I hopefully most of our listeners are, are aware of, but mm-hmm. if they're not, it's where you take key ideas from a sentence and then later rebuild that sentence. Uh, And those key ideas are just three words. For a dyslexic, that's helpful because they can just ignore all the words they don't understand. If they get the gist of the sentence, they can record the words that they know how to read and they can put that down. So that was helpful. Uh, The second thing about the system that is useful for a dyslexic is that when you write your rough draft, it does not have to look pretty. You know, we encourage it to be unpretty. So for a dyslexic, they can just free flow horrible spelling, mm. which was something I had to learn how to be okay with actually. Mm. Now that it, I wasn't really planning on bringing this up, but I was thinking about it. And initially I was very discouraged by physically writing things because I was so concerned with getting everything spelled correctly. But eventually I stopped caring 100% about spelling and would just start free flowing ideas. And it released me from kind of this, you know, death grip on the pencil, just frowning really hard while I tried to think of if it's a TH word or if it's just a T word, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that aspect of not caring about how it ended up was very useful. And then I could then read that rough draft over to a parent and they would help me, help me do it. And I, I also later got a speech dictation software which was able to do that for my parents, which I'm sure they appreciated. (laughs) Um, I loved writing, so I was always trying to get them to listen to me and write down what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Great. How old were you at this time when things started to really click for you? I would say 11 going into 12 was when I started to independently read. Okay. Um, And an aspect of that which encouraged me to read was that the audiobooks that I was able to listen to were only the audiobooks that my father would give me, which meant they were audiobooks from the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> but the books that I was allowed to read was anything I wanted to. Mm. So mm. anything that I wanted to read, they would pretty much let me read. There may be a, a very few exceptions, but generally they were pretty pretty open. I mean, I read some really garbage books, <laughs> but I read them, uh-huh. you know, and, and that probably picked up at around 12. Mm-hmm. And so I, I became a professional book skimmer <laughs> at about 12. <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice. And so by the time you moved here, you were now reading and writing and mm-hmm. able to join other students in classes. True. Uh, I definitely was, and I was able to hide dyslexia from most people. Uh, They wouldn't have probably known it based on how I was performing. But that being said, it was always an ever-present condition. Dyslexia never goes away, no matter how much better you get at mitigating the negatives of it. So I was always slower reading things. And when people wrote things up on the board, I would have to look at the board, look at my paper, look up at the board, look at my paper, look up at the board, look at my paper, look up at the board, for every single letter. I wasn't able to just read it and then re-put it, put it on a separate piece of paper. Dyslexics have difficulty sequencing information and then recalling it in the correct order. And that has to do with the fact that they have that lateral thinking. They were thinking so many different types of things that trying to remember things in the correct order can be very difficult, which is why spelling is impossible. Because what is spelling? As it's defined by the great Andrew Poudoir, <laughs> it's defined as the correct retrieval of sequentially stored, virtually random bits of information. And that's the thing that the dyslexics will have the most difficulty doing is retrieving sequentially stored information. That's a big difficulty for for many areas of their life, even moving forward. Mm -hmm. So for me, I still had difficulties with certain areas, but I got really good at learning coping mechanisms for those areas. Okay. I got got good at uh, teaching myself tricks to remember things. I learned about a technique where you imagine yourself in a house and then you can remember things in different rooms or associated with different pictures or walls or, or things in the house. For me, being a very visual person and being great at seeing things in a spatial way and manipulating in my head, building an imaginary house in my head was easy peasy. Mm -hmm. Filling it up with random pieces of information generally helped me remember those pieces of information in better order. Uh, In addition to that, I was great at gaining information without reading. If it was a teacher who was writing stuff on the board, I could gain a lot of information just from listening to him and taking notes and not really reading the board. 
and and vice versa. You can pick up on how other people talk or how other people are thinking about something and gain a lot of information about the text. I used to, when I was much younger, I used to read through these illustrated books. Uh, they were they were highly abridged versions of classic books, and there was one. It was a uh, Gulliver's Travels. Okay. And it had a picture for every single page of the book. Oh, nice. And so I would just look at all the pictures for the whole book and basically get the whole story from the pictures, which was really fun. But mm-hmm. you, uh, a, a dyslexic, one of the things that Richard Branson uh, says was the, the biggest factor that helped him become an entrepreneur was that because he was dyslexic, he had to learn information in unique ways. He had to pick up on it in different ways. And picking up on that information in those ways was something that, you have to learn as a dyslexic in order to function like anybody else. So I know that there's a lot of teachers and parents who are listening to this who are just amazed at your story. Do you have any specific recommendations to them that will help them as they're coaching and guiding their students, their children? So I would have a few recommendations. The The first recommendation I would have is to play to their strengths, not to their disabilities. Mm-hmm. There's a, a natural tendency to try and correct something that's wrong. And for, for a dyslexic, a teacher of a dyslexic, what looks wrong is their spelling or the way that they can't read something out loud to you or they can't remember those math facts no, no matter how many times you drilled them on it. That seems wrong and you want to correct it and you want to focus on that. But what you're forgetting is that all of those things that they're worse at are areas that their brain has allowed them to be worse at in order that they're better at different areas. Their brain has hijacked their language centers for spatial reasoning, for lateral thinking. So if you have a a dyslexic child or you have a dyslexic student and they have an interest in something where they really feel like they're good at it, tell them they're good at it. Make Mm -hmm. sure that they know that they are good at that and that they have a gift which could help them become phenomenal at it Mm -hmm. and play to that strength. Mm -hmm. On on a more basic level, uh, give them the tools that mitigate the issues that they face and allow them to pursue the things that they're good at. Mm. Don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. Dyslexia is a gift. It is not a disability. There's a, there's a book called the dyslexic advantage. The dyslexic advantage, it outlines, uh, what they call the mind strengths of dyslexia. Mm. And mind is an acronym, and M stands for material reasoning, which I've mentioned throughout this, this podcast a little bit, but material reasoning is the spatial reasoning, flipping objects in your head, looking at a floor plan and being able to imagine the house from the floor plan. Mm. There's a famous story of a, a dyslexic architect who was able to look at a floor plan and imagine what looking out of the top building window would look like. And he was able to tell them that they would see this one tree in this angle, and so they had to remove the tree. And he knew about all of it just from looking at the floor plan, Hmm. and that was his ability to spatial reason. Um, The second is I, which stands for interconnected reasoning. And I've also talked about this. That's the lateral thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Because dyslexics have further apart uh, micro columns, they're able to think across larger regions of their brain, which allow them to connect different things. That's why you have 40% of entrepreneurs who are dyslexic, because what is an entrepreneur? Someone who sees a problem and reaches out to a place nobody has thought of before and fixes the problem with that solution, right. which is interconnected thinking. The third is narrative reasoning. Hmm. And this is something that a lot of parents will probably agree their kids love to tell stories. <laughs> okay. Dyslexics love stories and they can paint really good pictures and they can paint like descriptive narratives and use it in order to convince people to do things or not to do things. The last of the mind strengths is dynamic reasoning. And dynamic reasoning is another aspect that kind of plays into that un- unfair number of dyslexics that become entrepreneurs. And it's the ability to look at a current situation and either interpret that situation and predict the future or interpret the situation and predict the distant past. So in the case of an entrepreneur, they would be able to see the current situation and predict maybe market trends in the future and then be prepared for those market trends when they happen. In the case of archaeology, where there's actually a disproportionate amount of dyslexics, you're able to, say, look at a hill and envision what the hill looked like 
100,000 years ago before rain changed the, the face of the rock. And you're able to imagine if it's changed this much, what it might look like in another two or 3,000 years and interpret what it would look like and paint that picture in your head visually. So those are the, the mind strengths in those books. And I would really recommend reading those books if you're interested in, in learning more about the positive side of dyslexia and, and stopping, stopping maybe an over-focus on the negative, which is so easy to fall into. So, Chris, I, I'm going to circle back just for a moment because we spent just a, a few minutes, not even that, probably talking about the skill of writing mm-hmm. and how you learned to write. You obviously had the thoughts to write, but the actual act of putting words on paper, mm-hmm. how did that work for you? So I think that the biggest factor reg- that will affect writing is how much literature or vocabulary you've learned up to that point. And I mentioned earlier audiobooks, and I do think that that helped me really quickly transition into writing. But in terms of of writing and the actual mechanics of writing, you have to realize that dyslexics expend approximately five times more energy when trying to read and write things than non-dyslexics. And when you're trying to write a paper and you're faced with a blank page, right, the blank page problem, you have this incredible amount of mental stress, which just shuts down your brain. You can't do much. The advantage of the IEW system is that you don't have to face the blank page problem and you can break things into very small and achievable tasks depending on the level. So if, you're, if your kid is dyslexic and has difficulty writing things and you're helping him write them down, he's, he's narrating it out to you, but it's still stressful for him because you know, he doesn't know if you're going to get it correct and he doesn't really speak in correct sentences yet because he hasn't had that language base come inside. If he just has to focus on one paragraph you know, or he just has to focus on one sentence at a time, he's going to be much more, uh, he's going to have more confidence in himself to accomplish that goal. And, and that's where I think IEW does help because we really do break down progressively more complicated assignments into doable and achievable chunks. And I also believe that dyslexia, dyslexia allows you to manipulate things in your brain, right? It allows you to see things in, in, in patterns in a spatial way. Writing is actually very spatial. Yes. You have to, w- once you get past just putting things on paper and the mechanics of spelling and all that, if you ignore all that and use autocorrect and use speech <laughs> software, writing is actually very, uh, like a puzzle piece, mm-hmm. right? And as you learn things, as you learn like the who, which clause, as you learn different aspects, the, the stylistic techniques, you start to see the patterns of language and how you can rearrange those patterns to tell points in different ways. You can take a clause here and insert it over here. You can space things out. You can make that, you know, a dramatic fragment. Like your mind will start to see things in a visual way, despite the fact that it's writing. And I think that focusing on the stylistic and structural side of writing really allows dyslexics to start to have fun with it and see it more of a visual way as opposed to a a, a task or a chore. So you're in college now. Do you ever have to write papers in college? So I, I do have to write papers for, for school, and it's I'm pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. I don't really struggle too much writing anymore. I, my spelling will probably always be worse than someone without dyslexia. And my reading speed will probably always be a little bit slower than someone without dyslexia. But my ability to think is unique, and I'm able to translate that into words, and I think that it, it gives me a skill in terms of arranging my ideas and arguments in, in a particular way. So I would say at this point in my life, dyslexia really only has advantages for me, and it doesn't have many disadvantages. Great. Well, Chris, this has been a delightful conversation today and last week as well. And thank you for being willing to be on this podcast in place of your father yeah. while he's out traveling. And yeah, second best is still good, right? <laughs> that's right. That's what they say. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudoua and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.